what is, yeah. what is your framework of working with a patient that you are very convinced has, you know, symptomatology that could be related to long COVID? I mean, I know a lot of this is probably going to be related to, you know, how do you, you know, mobilize this spoke, spike protein? How do you bind it? How do you move it? Like what, tell me a little bit about your framework there and how you do it. How do you think about it? So, so most of my patients, I'll get the microclotting on them. Cause I would say like 90% of them have that. And like, okay. and that also gives like validation. Cause then, you know, that you're having this protein that's bulging right off the bat. You're having probably a lot of endotheliitis. Oh, the other thing too, what's happening, which is, which people should think about too, is the glycocalyx is being completely yes. destroyed, right? right? Completely destroyed. And when the glycocalyx is destroyed, you just have this, like, it's set up so perfectly for spike to just start like flying into the endothelium and just causing this massive amount of endotheliitis, right? And then we know that then activates the platelets and then that activates all these different clotting cascades and so on and so forth. And then all this, it's like, a you right. know, just a vicious cycle of awfulness. Um, so what we do is we want to do several things. We want to deal with persistent virus. We want to deal with spike. This is a very important concept to understand, and we have proof of concept with this too in the research. So we know that spike doesn't want to be in the blood. It's literally really sitting in the tissues, to be honest mm. with you. It's like in the epithelia, it's in the tissue, all right? And when you give the senolytics, if you drew blood on somebody, like on an app, most people, and you did a blood spot on them and then sent it off for analysis because there are labs that can, like in, my research is showing this, like I'm going to be able to pre present this in a few months, whatever, okay. but yeah. it will show this, that you won't, you won't see a lot. You won't pick a lot up in the blood or even in the PBMCs in the peripheral blood mononuclear cells, right? If you dose them with senolytics and then take the blood two hours later, it almost looks like a completely different patient. Wow. You'll mobilize spike in a lot of these patients, like at exponential rates, like, and the PBMNs are, are then riddled with spike because wow. they phagocytose yeah. it. And okay. then you're like, oh, well, that's messed up because now you like, you infected all of these PBMNs with it, right? But the problem is, is those will regenerate, right? And you just want to take them out and get spike out, bind it, you know, bust them up, get spike out intact right? Because now, you know, I just taught you, you don't want to break the spike up because of these epitopes that could be possibly making things worse for a lot of people. Right. Okay. And I will tell you, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to make a big thing, but I was using some specific systemic enzymes, you know, up front in the, in the initial iterations of our protocol, we had them in, in, and the beta amp, the A beta 4240 in over 50% of the patients got worse. And mm. then I got, we got nervous that we were potentiating these beta at this beta amyloid formation from breaking spike apart. Breaking so you want to okay. keep spike intact, find it. But at the same time, remember, I told you spike is a magnet for all these different host cell receptors. Yeah. So you have to have things on board that are blocking the receptor binding domain, right? So they're, like, out, so, they're so, out competing it or like they're competing for the same receptor binding domain or how do yeah, you do Yeah, so it? the poly, right. So those polyphenol compounds, I'll share with you, like we could put up a lot of the uh, pathways, whatever, but a lot of those different polyphenol compounds will do this. They'll block okay. the furin cleavage site. They'll block the, the RBD, the, you know, because you don't want to then have the spike if it's not all bound up. If there's any free, you don't want it then to go into a different cell and start causing the same issues, right? And make that cell, make that cell a senescent cell. So it's like very complicated. Yeah. It's so you're really preventing, hard. Yeah. You're preventing it from binding to the tissue or trying to prevent it, right? And that's with some of these polyphenols. And then you're trying to take it out whole without and bind it. So what are you using the from senolytics, the senolytics? The senolytics. Okay. So they developed this product called senolescence, which are a bunch of these different, like, you know, fisetin and a mm -hmm. high, very high dose of resveratrol. And there's like a few other things in there which are acts as a senolytics. But remember in the medicinals, there's also like four different senolytics in there too. But you're only dosing the senolytics like once a week. Like you're not, because you don't want to do too much of that because then you could like, it could be bad, right? Like you have to be very careful. And then the binders, you're putting tons of binders on board, right? What kind of binders? Now, so the binders are um, Fucoidon. Okay. Fucoidon is like a Japanese seaweed. 
Okay. It has a very high affinity for spike protein. Like heparin, heparin um, is one of the best binders to spike, and it has more, it has greater affinity than even heparin does. Um, mm, okay. And then humic acid, there's a specific type of humic acid that's a very good binder that they sourced in Europe too. That's super helpful because the problem with the humic acid in the, the ones that we were sourcing in the US, they're contaminated with, with fulvic acid and you can't okay. have the fulvic acid. It won't work. It doesn't bind the same way. And then there's some other binders. And then I was using, I started to use pentacin because pentacin um, actually is a polysaccharide also just like um, just like fucoidon, and it is very strong affinity to the spike. And it also acts as a weak anticoagulant. So I'll use that for two weeks up front at like a little bit of a higher dose because I want to just like really bind, bind up that spike. And I like to use it because I think it helps with the microclotting a little bit mm. and like breaking that up. Um, and the fucoidon, by the way, is amazing at restoring the glycocalyx. Like it's, there's tons of studies to support that mm. it helps with restoration of the glycocalyx layer. So, and you know, and I use like, but I use like endocalyx pro and some of those other, you know, or, you know, like I use those products too. Um, I would love to study that. I would love to do befores and afters with the glycocalyx check to see how we're restoring the glycocalyx after we move this out. Cause I think that we really are, um, especially given like a lot of the biomarkers mm. that we're following, uh, seeing the patient's get better with that. But yeah, so we're doing the combination of those things, like putting on the omega three, nine, like I said, as well. And then I'm just like adding things in as we go to, to rebuild, to restore health and balance of the gut microbiome. Cause like I said, it's right. completely sure. destroyed. So I'll use, right. we using like lorazotide pentacin. I'm using KPF BPC 157. I'm using high dose zinc CD because the combination of them, you know, those on their own, what they do, and they also help with the phyto. Um, I use serum bovine immunoglobulins, like a little bit more down the road. Um, mm -hmm. What else do I use? I don't know. I don't. I wish I had my protocol right in front of me, but no, I can share is, it for you. Yeah, um, that'd be great. So we're we, using we all these different. Screen. Yeah, so it's sort of like a layered <laughs> process, like a, you know, but that's just like foundational, right? Because right. now you're you're trying to mobilize and do this foundationally for everyone and at least start getting it out of them, you know? But then there's so much other work that has to be done, especially for so many of these moderate to, moderate to severe patients that are so sick that it, and that haven't gotten to us for like three plus years, right? right. So now they just have all this downstream inflammation and right. all these end organ and all, all these, and you know, the, you know, more like pathological things as a result. And I think so, and I think at the end stage, we believe we believe in our group, the end stage is disease is really this auto autoimmune disease where these people and it's not a typical autoimmune disease. I'm saying from all these auto antibodies and molecular mimicry that was created by the spike protein, right? And has done all this end organ damage, right? And I don't I'm not even certain, I don't know, you know, not to say, I mean, what well, we're trying to test this too. Do those people still have spike even? Or is this just like, you know the aftermath. Right. And it's now, you have, to deal, and now yeah. you have to deal with that. And so, and remember, it's like everything. It's like cardiovascular, neurovascular, thrombotic. It's cancer. I mean, God, the immunosenescence that is occurring, right? What it does to interferon, what it does, like that we know the spike protein completely just regulates the T cells, the B cells, you know, the natural killer cells, like all these different things. So like, that's why we're also so immune deficient. Like you see right. people now can't get over their colds like they right. used to. And now we have this whole epidemic. You, I'm sure you're following a mycoplasma, right? I talked about at the conference, like 40 year olds getting RSV, like ginormous, like parts of, you know, my town, like so many people have it. Like when yeah. did, I never saw that, you no. know, so we're sort of like an immune deficient population because of this, you yeah. know? So this is a controversial question, but when it comes yeah. to yeah. long COVID in the respect of vaccine induced, yeah. maybe versus yeah. wild type, have you seen yeah. any, may I mean, I think maybe it's hard to even know at this point because like yeah. there were so many people that have gotten the vaccine and also had wild type and then vice versa. Right. Right. But do you have, do you have a sense of, at least from my perspective, like when I've used hyperbaric therapy in patients yeah. that have either been you know, vaccine induced supposedly versus wild type, it always seems to be harder to treat the ones the with vaccine induced. But yeah. what are you seeing in your clinic? Is that, is there a difference? I, 
I, you know, it's funny. I find that that's true, but I also have a bunch of patients that got COVID early on and mm-hmm. never even got vaccinated and they are just as sick as the vaccine induced. It's really interesting. And by the way, I didn't mean to fail to mention like all the beautiful modalities that you'd like H bot is unbelievable, you know, mm-hmm. you know, using all these other things, red light therapy, ozone, e like all these other amazing methylene modalities. Well. Yeah, like sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my God, you know, I'm yeah. using methylene blue. I bother you all the time about it. Yeah. Yes. Like, and, and that's what I meant to say. Like after I do that part, course, I start yeah. really honing in. Oh, and I use the one M and a thanks to, you know, Elizabeth up yep. front. I use yep. that up front in everybody. Um, I meant to say that. Yeah. And then I really start working on the mitochondria, like, right, right like right. pretty within a few weeks or whatever, like I'll see how the patient's doing, but then I'm using like SS31 and human in, and I'm using the methylene blue and um, I'm using dihexa, you know, like, mm-hmm. a, you know, a lot of these different peptides. And right. you're tailoring really it to the person. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're tailoring. Right. Then that's right. where the precision yeah. comes in. Right. Exactly. You, know? right. you have, you have like a general protocol for most people because you understand that you have to deal with the virus. You have to deal with the, the spike protein and there's all these ways to do that. But then you have to say like, where is their end organ damage or where are they most mm-hmm. symptomatic? Right. Very and then well that's cut. when you're going to be tailoring their protocol. Yeah. But in essence, what you're seeing is you're seeing like sort of the downstream process of people having, you know, continued spike protein replication, or if it's the virus Mm -hmm. itself causing all these things that you're seeing like autoimmune like Mm -hmm. symptoms or issues, cancer, neurodegenerative disease that looks kind of weird. And, and I mean, I, I've seen this also in clinical practice too. I don't see as many people as you do, but it's, it's been crazy. Right. And, you know, my father's a chiropractor in New York. I think I mentioned he he sees, Uh he sees so many people and then has so much, more cancer in younger people, like yes. these viral infections yes. that are happening. It's, it's kind of across the board. So I think what you said is really helpful, which is like, we're seeing, like we have an immune deficient population now on some level, right? Because mm-hmm. of these exposures that we've seen. So yeah. um, I think you know, I, uh, Scott, you want to know what I think? I think we're going to have to move our screenings up. I think, I think we're going to have to move the screenings back. Wow. We're going to wait see by younger. 10 years. Yeah. Or, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like yeah. move them. Yeah. I really the, do because I think it is a true age accelerant and it's aging us so much quicker than we would have. So that's why we're developing all these things earlier. Like you're going to see neurodegenerative diseases in much younger patients, these cancers in much younger patients. Like we're, or we're already seeing it. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, and then in the more moderate to severe patients um, that, you know, sometimes the protocol, like it starts to move the needle, but not as much. Like you can use all these other amazing treatments, you know, like, the EBU works amazing. I, oh my God, it's unbelievable. We're testing that right now to see how it's removing spike protein um, and the toxic like peptides, removal of that, um, you know, because even though, again, you're going after the root, like getting rid of those, which are, you know, the circulating peptides, could, you know, could be helpful and just like relieving symptomatology. Sure. Um, and and um, cerebral lysine. Oh my God, I have such amazing results with the cerebral lysine. I can't even tell you. Like this is for people with more neuro- neurodegenerative kinds with of people. With that are, or no, yeah. or even yeah, and even just the patients that have their head just feels like they just feel like they're under like water, you know, mm-hmm. and have all mm-hmm. this pressure. And Suzanne Gaza taught me to use Nurtec like years ago, so I use the Nurtec. But I found now that like the Nurtec does work better. Once the patient's like a little better, I didn't have such a good response, but now I'm finding that once you get the patient like sort of over the hump, they're responding better to it. But there's all these different modalities that we can talk about, all these different peptides, repurposed. Oh, Amlexinox. Thanks again. Like I was using it a little bit before I saw Betsy speak at the SSRP. And then mm-hmm. I really started using it because she Dr. built Earth. like yeah. confidence in me. Yeah. Sure. Dr. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, wow. Why was, and then because I was pumping people full, oh, because that's such a big deal. So I know I'm all over the place with the mast cell. Mast cell activation is so big, but if you can quell that and just like quiet it down a little bit and just get the person to feel better a little bit better, they'll get better faster. Right. Right. And so using those mast cell stabilizers Stabilizers. and histamine blockers, it just like sort of quiets things down. So they're not so revved up, you know, like, yeah, yeah, totally. And it's helpful for a lot of people. So what I think is would be helpful as as we're talking is like you've thrown like a lot out there as far as like what's no 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 what I mean is like don't be don't apologize this is amazing right like what I think is what I think is helpful from like a framework perspective is that 
you're not saying that you, you're using every one of these things with every single patient. The idea mm -hmm. is that you have like a foundational number of things that you ask everybody to take if possible. And then you are directing some of these additional therapies, depending on what their, what their symptoms are. Like you talked about cerebral license specifically yeah. for these brain related symptoms, right? Yeah. For example, methylene um, so, blue, the methylene yeah. blue works great for the chronic fatigue, PEM, the brain mm -hmm. fog. Like I love it. You know, it's great. Like a yeah. lot of these things that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. I, and I and I think that as people are thinking about this in their own practices, like, you know, there is, I know you've published a lot of this already and you're gonna be publishing more. And I know there's very few people like you that are doing this. Um, when you, you know, think about not only the, you know, sort of the chronic treatment and like long COVID and, and the aspect, but like you talked a little bit about this earlier, which was, you know, prophylaxis. Like you're basically telling me and us that we're all getting infected all the time. Right. We're all getting, because it's, it's, it's out there, it's in the community, our little cold congestions, whatever they're, some of these are going to be COVID themselves. Right. So is your a feeling that all of us should be on some sort of prophylaxis here all the time? I do. I do. 